Your genetics can have a significant influence on your posture, meaning the curvature of the spine that you're naturally going to be biased towards, the shape of your pelvis, and even what movements you're naturally going to be better or worse at. Today, I'm gonna to break down the two main archetypes and help you make sense of things that you probably are already somewhat aware of, but you've never quite put it together like this, and it will help you explain a lot about your own body, and even possibly what you can do to best individualize your approach to improving your posture and movement. Now credit where credit is due. I did not come up with this theory. This is originally from a physical therapist named Bill Hartman. So this is something that he's developed over the last couple of decades and it's made its way into the fitness and rehab industry and it's gaining popularity. Based on this theory, we have two main types of body shapes. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about ectomorphs or endomorphs, and that can play into it to some extent, but it goes deeper than that. The area that we're looking at that differentiates human beings is what we call the infrasternal angle. This is the angle of the rib cage from here to about here. This angle can be wider or it can be more narrow and generally there's a range that differentiates wide and narrow infrasternal angle measurements. We can have a wider infrasternal angle or we can have a more narrow infrasternal angle, meaning that these lower ribs are in a position where they shorten or close off this angle, or we have a position where they're wider and more open like this. These ribs are essentially swung outwards or inwards more. Now this angle can have an effect globally on the rest of our body and what joint positions we're naturally biased towards and what shapes we're naturally biased towards. And a lot of it has to do with our breathing strategy. Now I'm going to simplify this, but just know that it gets a little bit more complicated and in depth. I'd be happy to release more content on this, but just know that this is an introductory video. It's important to know that these lower ribs can change shape more easily than almost any other bone in the rest of our skeleton. So these bones like to move in certain positions when they're trying to make up for a lack of movement at other ribs potentially, or a lack of function in some way, shape, or form at other ribs. Think in your head really quickly about what types of people you've met throughout your life who are naturally really good at certain sports or activities and not as good in others. For example, you might look at someone who's sort of a bigger build and naturally muscular build and you might go, okay, you're probably going to be a better rugby player or a better American football player than you are a marathon runner. And you might look at a marathon runner's body and go, okay, you're probably going to be really good at running or longer duration events rather than a sprinter. You don't have a sprinter's build, you have more of a cross country or marathon running build. We kind of naturally intuitively know this and that's what feeds into this methodology. Your bigger builds are usually but not always going to have a wider infrasternal angle. A narrow build will typically but certainly not always have more of a narrow infrasternal angle. Now it's a gradient and this is very important to understand. We can have on one end of this spectrum a wide infrasternal angle and on the other the narrow. And most people are somewhere in between. Very rarely is someone directly in the middle. It does happen, but it's usually because they're compensating out of one of these areas. But most people tend to be on one side or the other of the spectrum. First, it's important to break down the mechanics of how humans breathe, because this is gonna make a lot more sense as we understand these patterns. When we inhale, we should see a systemic movement of external rotation throughout the body. So the rib cage externally rotates and opens up. The pelvis is going to externally rotate and open up to a slight extent. So you're going to see these bones flare out like this, and you're going to see the diaphragm drop. You're going to see the pelvic floor drop. Those are the keys. When we exhale, the opposite happens. The rib cage closes down, the ribs internally rotate, the pelvis moves into more of an internally rotated position, and the spine curves are going to increase throughout the body. An inhaled position of the spine is one that doesn't have as many curves to it, meaning that when we inhale, we're going to get a little bit taller because these ribs open up. We're going to have the pelvis sort of tilt and open up backwards and this is going to allow us to overall flatten out our spine. External rotation is generally a position of force absorption. We're opening up so that way we can absorb force. In 
internal rotation, therefore, is more of a position of force production. When we exhale, we produce force. This is why when you're lifting weights, you exhale on the hard part of the lift because that's helping you compress to produce force. Now let's break down the differences between a narrow and a wide infrasternal angle. A narrow infrasternal angle is someone who's going to be biased towards an inhaled position of their body, meaning that their ribs are more externally rotated up here. Their pelvis is in more of an externally rotated position like this, where it's opened up and the pelvic floor is dropped and the diaphragm is dropped. But the problem is, is that they don't have the ability to fully exhale. So they have to seek a strategy to create an exhalation compensation. And the way that they do that is via the path of least resistance. They're gonna go, okay, well, if I can't exhale, I'm gonna find a way to do that. And the way I can do that is via the path of least resistance and moving the bones that are the most easily movable, which are right here, and they're gonna close off this space bringing their infrasternal angle to less than 100 degrees in many cases. So the infrasternal angle being narrow or wide is a result of the compensation, not what's actually happening within the body. I know that's weird to think about, but to make it simple, if I'm inhaled, and I'm biased towards external rotation and force absorption, gotta find a way to still produce force and in internal rotation. So I'm gonna do it at the easiest place, which is right here. Because inhalation flattens out the spine, we tend to see more flat spine curves in this population relative to the wider infrasternal angles. These narrow infrasternal angles can much more easily get into a deep squat position with just their body weight relative to a wide infrasternal angle because a squat necessitates external rotation of the hips and the pelvis. A wide infrasternal angle, therefore, is the opposite. They tend to have a rib cage and pelvis and overall skeleton biased towards internal rotation or force production. So these ribs are down. This pelvis is in a shape like this where it's closed packed and internally rotated but they need to find a way to inhale. They need to find an inhalation compensation. So the way that they do that is via the path of least resistance to open up these lower ribs and widen them out so that way they can breathe into an area quite easily. Because exhalation reduces spine curves, you typically see these people have exaggerated spine curves like this, but these people are also really good at hinging because a deadlift requires internal rotation more than external rotation. So these people tend to be very good at naturally deadlifting. But again, we already kind of know this, right? Think about your naturally big, strong Samoan guy and compare that to your small, thin, marathon running female. You kind of get an idea of what we're going for here and what, what they would naturally be good at. Now this is just the baseline guys, and we can and do compensate from this original starting bias here. And this is not at all to say that a narrow infrasternal angle person can never be good at producing force rapidly or being a power lifter or someone that's very big and strong and jacked, or that a wide infrasternal angle person can never run a marathon successfully. But what it is saying is that everyone tends to be on a gradient and the people on the more extreme ends of the gradient and spectrum are going to have a harder time being successful at that other thing, but they're gonna be really good at the thing that they're naturally biased towards. The overall goal is to restore dynamic movement of the infrasternal angle, meaning that it's not just stuck in a position where it's flared up or down here. We want to improve the ability for it upon inhalation to open up for those narrows and upon exhalation to close down for one of those wide infrasternal angles. So we want to be able to get these gaps filled in. We generally want to train more external rotation for a wide infrasternal angle to fill in the gaps of what they're missing. And for a narrow, we want to train more internal rotation based joint actions. For example, I might do more squat like activities with a wide infrasternal angle and more hingey type activities for a narrow infrasternal angle in the gym. For your general corrective or positive posture exercises as you may want to think of them. I'm also going to think along the lines of how do I improve internal rotation throughout the body for more of a narrow infrasternal angle, external rotation for a wide infrasternal angle. An example of this for a wide infrasternal angle would be a sideline position because research has shown that a sideline position gives us the most lateral compression of the rib cage via gravity sort of pushing down on the rib cage from one side and the floor pushing into the rib cage on the other. This can help narrow the infrasternal angle and as they breathe through it, they can get 
get more expansion in the rib cage areas they were limited in rather than just right here. And also they can improve internal rotation of the pelvis in a 90-90 side lying position. So this is a really good way to start to get them to open up the rib cage areas that they're limited in. This is the side lying lateral decompression with a rib cage focus. What we're gonna do is get in this side lying position with our knees and hips bent at a 60 degree angle each and we're going to have a foam roller, ideally a soft one, not one with like ridges or anything, just something like this. And we're gonna place it three inches-ish below our armpit. And all we're gonna do is just support our head passively with that downside. There should be zero tension in our body whatsoever. We're just chilling, hanging out here. And then the other arm is just hanging out on the floor there. It's not excessively rolled forward or backward too much. It's just stacked over the shoulder to a relative extent. And then we're going to breathe in through our nose softly and fully exhale through our mouth. Sigh the air out for about five to eight full seconds. At the end of that full exhale, you might feel a little side abs engaged, particularly on that top side right there. And if you do, that's great. Close your mouth, put your tongue on the roof of your mouth and very softly inhale through your nose. You should not feel your neck engage, but you should feel some expansion within your rib cage, particularly on the top side when you inhale softly for about three to five seconds. An option we may have you do is to reach overhead very gently and in a very relaxed manner. Just kind of let the arm kind of hang over your head a little bit. And the reach should not be behind you because that will extend you and inflate your rib cage. It should be slightly in front of your head. That will ensure you can keep this rib cage nice and in a good position. For a narrow infrasternal angle, putting them in a supine or laying on your back position is really good for helping to open up these lower ribs. And also I wanna bias their hips towards more internal rotation. So what Connor's gonna do to start is he's gonna find a wall and if he has something like a DC block here or a bench, he's gonna just put it underneath his feet He's gonna get this 90 degree angle at his hips and at his torso. So he's got a 90 degree bend at the knee and the hips. Feet are about hip width apart, just flush against the wall. And we have a towel roll here underneath his head to give him some cervical lordosis, kind of tipping that chin back to a more neutral position and a ball between his legs just as a placeholder. So from here, he's gonna have his arms away from his sides at about a 45 degree angle and he can have his wrist either neutral like it is now with his thumb up towards the ceiling or he can internally rotate or pronate his hand as much as he comfortably can without his shoulders popping up. That's what we don't want to see. So now what Connor is going to do with about a 2 out of 10 effort and his feet just flush against the wall is he's going to pull down into that block peeling his tailbone slightly off the floor. Should feel some hamstrings. From here he's going to gently press down with about a 1, 2 out of 10 effort max into the floor with his hands with that pronated hand position or more that neutral hand position, whatever feels most comfortable for him. He's going to exhale like he's fogging up a window in the winter, nice and slow through his mouth. 